two wow. weeks later, two weeks later, the governor of California shut all businesses down that were non-essential. And so uh, 75% of the business at Stark was shut down. The doctors continued to operate and we continue to sell supplements and stuff like that, but it's not a significant part of the business. And so now I had very little cash and we were shut down. It was a very scary time, but we were able to um, prosper through that. But it was a really, um, it was kind of a beautiful time from a, from the looking at humanity, at least my little bubble of it. Yeah. I, I had, I explained to my people that we have a very small amount of money, cash available. I had some employees come to me and say, um, you don't have, you don't have to pay me. Uh, if that will make it easier for you to pay these other people, like I'm going to, I'm living with my mom, I'm living mm -hmm. with my family. I know that Joe over there is, is on his own. And he's really stressed financially. And so everybody uh, attempted to help each other. I couldn't do that legally in the state of California. So I, I didn't. But it was kind of a beautiful thing to see people becoming so selfless through such a scary um, situation. Welcome to the Break Free Podcast. I am your host, uh, David Mansala. As uh, everybody knows, this podcast is dedicated to shine the light to the business world from uh, successful entrepreneurs and people that are making this world a better place. And what a better example of my brother Todd today. Todd, welcome to I, the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to, to be here with you. Thank you for I, putting me into that category. <laughs> I appreciate that. Todd, um, for the audience, uh, tell me your full name, where do you live and what do you do for a living? My name is Todd Vandehei, and I live in Southern California, Orange County specifically. And I run a business called Stark. And Stark is a, essentially it's a healthcare business that focuses on fitness outcomes. So it's a medically supervised fitness business. Um, what that means is further is that we, we have a full medical staff, uh, doctors, phlebotomists. We also have chiropractors, nutritionists, and personal trainers, and they all work together to collaborate on behalf of a, an individual patient, client, or student. We refer them to them as students. Mm -hmm. And I guess you're a classic example that your, your system works because you look in so good shape. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I am the, the crash dummy of the company, the, the, the one where uh, everything is tried on first and um, the success is evaluated. And then we, we roll out a service or a particular treatment um, past that. So, um, uh, I am the culmination of a lot of work that we've done over the last 12 years because the business is 12 years old. Um, and yes, I do represent our work product. I, I, I can't claim that I accomplished this on my own because most of my career was spent in carpet manufacturing. It has nothing to do with our current business. Um, but um, uh, the result is uh, that I've been able to go through our process with an open mind without a lot of pre-existing um, considerations around what I think works or doesn't work because frankly, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And so I just follow the process like the very best possible student can. Um, and, and this has been the result. Um, we generally, it de generally doesn't take 12 years to get to where I am uh, mm -hmm. because we found faster processes, fast, faster means with which to get there. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, yes, I do. I exhibit our work product. I live it. Um, it's, yeah. it's also what's expected with all of our, we currently have about 65 employees and it's what's expected among all of them, whether you're in the accounting department or the marketing department, um, or you're, of course, you're a coach or a doctor, we're expected, uh, we expect you to exhibit our work product and go through yeah. the process like all of our students do. Be the example, which is beautiful, because how many times I have gone to gyms and you look at their personal trainers and they're fat? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, that's uh, part of my inspiration to make sure that that does not happen. Um, but the other part is that when you're on the inside of the company and you're working as a part of the team, you're much more likely to share your positive and certainly negative opinions about the things that we have our, our students go through as standard operating procedure. And so uh, a lot of our best insight is provided by our team members, not necessarily by our patients and students. Mm -hmm. That's so it helps us grow. It helps us grow as a, as a team. Now, it's very intriguing to know that you were in carpet manufacturing and now you're in health and fitness. So let's let's go back in time. 
Last year of high school, where were you and what was in your mind? <laughs> last year in high school. <clears throat> well, my last year in high school was uh, mostly focused on getting into college. And um, and I'm, I'm from the Midwest originally, so not from, from out here. But I also, I, I always uh, imagined that I would um, run and own my own business. And I, I didn't exactly know what that looked like, but that was that was an aspiration from when I was probably as young as 13 or 14 years old. And, and that was back when entrepreneurs weren't looked at like they are today. Mm -hmm. At this stage, it seems as though entrepreneurs are put up on a pedestal. And, and back then it was very different. Um, at least in my household, in the community that I was in, my, my circle of friends, um, what the ideal aspiration was for someone that wanted to go into business was to go to work for a large organization. And in, in my mind, success was working for IBM with the eventual transition to um, to my own business. Uh, so that's kind of what was on my mind. Um, so what inspired you to become an entrepreneur from such a young age? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think that there's any one person. I don't know where it came from, um, but I think it's it's uh, tightly connected to um, my my biggest gift. I would say is creativity. And and I can I can identify uh, problems and and I love the process of creating solutions to those problems, um, and and it seemed obvious that that was part and parcel to being an entrepreneur. That was that was the center of, mm -hmm. of being an entrepreneur, and and it's much more complex than that, <laughs> as you know, um, and and I certainly have learned over the years. But that's that's what that's what drove me there. It was the it was the creative process. Um, uh, I felt I felt the like I was able to co contribute the best and and be sort of in the zone when I when I'm creative and I've always felt that way. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So what did you take in college? Did you did you made it in? Um, I studied business and I, uh, I I got a major in business and English um, and a minor in fine art. That's wonderful. So, were you already yeah. thinking about your first business uh, back in college, or did you get a did you ever get a job? Were you ever an employee of somebody else? Oh yeah, yeah. I spent most of my career as an employee, <clears throat> but when, when I was in college, funny enough, um, I got into working out, and not in a good way. Like uh, uh, meaning workouts from Muscle and Fitness magazine, and it was just a, the thing that it was in the '80s, and and it's it was. You know, people like Arnold Schwarzenegger were up in the limelight, and and but they were aspirational figures, at least among young men at that particular point in time. And so I, I got into it with a buddy of mine, and I remember walking back at like 11 o'clock at night because you know I lived like a college student, had hours like a college student, coming back from the gym, going to my dorm room, and we were talking about someday moving to California and opening a gym. <laughs> and that that was as close as I ever got to it up until of course uh, present day um, so, so that was my that was my early um, that was my early uh, business idea there was not, totally unformed and it was just a thought and it was merely because I wanted to be in a warm place it's, California seemed attractive uh, because of that because it was in the middle of winter in Minnesota um, and and I, I I loved the whole gym environment, mm -hmm. and that was it. Not good reasons, <laughs> to, uh, not good reasons for a launch pad for a business for sure. But isn't um, it crazy that many years later your dream came true? <laughs> it's it is it is absolutely crazy. Um, I when I look back at all the events that had to happen and to arrive at where I am today, it really is shocking and borderline miraculous that. I am sitting here in front of you today talking about our business. Beautiful. What did you do after you graduate? Well, I spent most of my career in carpet manufacturing, as I mentioned, starting out in sales uh, in the Midwest, um, started in Minneapolis, then moved to Chicago, uh, where I was a manufacturer's rep, and then uh, moved to California to get involved in management with the intention of um, becoming a, a partner in the manufacturing company. Um, shockingly, within a week, Uh, my new boss was introduced to me after I moved my my uh, I basically moved my life from uh, Chicago to California, and his purpose was to prepare the company to be sold. So my my idea and the reason I came to California, which I I verbalized in the interview process, 
um, the, with the intention of being a, a part owner of the company, which is very naive on my part at that point. I was 29 years old and I really didn't understand um, the, the, the challenges that entrepreneurs go through and what I was asking. But on the other end, you know, he, he could have, uh, his name was Al, he could have told me, yeah, yeah there's no way you're going to end up owning a part yeah. of this company. Um, and I probably wouldn't have come out. But, so it, it wasn't very, I w didn't feel great at that moment, but in hindsight, it was probably the best thing that, that ever happened to me. So uh, anyway, this new new boss was was given to me and and he was, um, uh, had been involved in M&A activity for decades, um, turning businesses around, preparing them to, and this was not a turnaround situation, but preparing them to go from kind of an entrepreneurial organization to be acquired. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he was exceptional at it. He became my mentor. And so instead of, instead of, um, of tucking my tail and moving back to the Midwest, I, I told him, his name is Royce, um, that I, I would like to have, I would like him to mentor me to be prepared to take his job someday. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying that to him and I was kind of nervous bringing it up because he didn't see, he, he had like this, he was scary, a scary, a giant, scary Italian, <laughs> like, like, like piercing through you kind of guy. Um, and, and he slapped me on my knee and said, he said, that sounds great. And, wow. and imme we immediately started. He, he in introduced me to the people on the manufacturing floor and got me involved in um, in actual manufacturing, like a crawling under equipment with engineers and understanding how everything worked and and getting a sense of what operational processes look like and why they're so critical and checks and balances, um, financials. He introduced me to all of the, the operational and financial parts of the business that I really had no understanding of, no appreciation of whatsoever uh, because I was primarily um, steeped in market sales and marketing. Right. And so it, it really helped round me out. Um, and, and then the company was acquired by a public company called the Dixie group. Um, and, and, and at that point Royce was fired, mm -hmm. which was devastating to me because he's my mentor and I was promoted. So I oh. took over the manufacturing company as the president. Um, and it was a very bittersweet thing because I felt like I was taking this job from my mentor. He, um, I don't think he was surprised by it because he's very, a very polarizing guy. I mean, I, he, he was an, definitely an aspirational figure to me. I wanted to be more like him in many ways, in some ways, maybe not so much. He wasn't very diplomatic and, and, and left a trail of broken relationships because he was so strong. Um, but, um, I, anyway, so I, I, uh, I stepped up in that role and um, and eventually had a conflict with the board of directors because they they were as they do and as they had the right to do uh, it's their duty they began making changes to the organization that uh, uh, was intended to increase shareholder value so it was in my opinion it was sort of short term like short sighted changes which is what uh, you know running a public company is all about unfortunately mm -hmm. and. And I didn't agree with them and, and I thought it would impair my ability to perform. And my name was on the performance of, of one particular business unit, of which there were only three in the company. So it was a significant um, part of the, the overall business. Um, and I, I told the board in a, like over about a 45 to 60 minute presentation at the end of the year, um, the, the last board meeting I, I was in for that company, that, um, that essentially they should, they should unwind these changes and go back to Georgia and, and we'll keep sending them the checks or they should find someone else to do my job. And about a week later, I got a call from my, my boss. Um, his name's Dan, um, really, really nice guy. I'm, I feel badly looking back that I actually put him through this, but he called me and, and, and with his thick Southern accent, he's like, Todd, we decided to replace you and, mm -hmm. and signed the severance agreement. And, and that was it. I retired. I, at least I thought I was, retired but uh i had a, at that point i had a significant uh real estate portfolio and intended to incrementally grow it um that's when really your personal need... investment side pardon me so that wasn't your personal investment side of things that was personal investment side yeah okay. yeah starting in chicago actually in my mid-20s i started investing in real estate that's great. um and yeah, i had another mentor who, who got me into that and and um it just blew my mind with um 
with looking back are fairly basic concepts, but, uh, but I really, I loved investing in real estate and I did that for about 15 years. <clears throat> and at the end of it, um, at the end of the, the investment, uh, experience that I had with real estate, 2008 hit and, and I lost everything, but $60,000, everything, the mil millions of dollars lost. Wow. And, and the security, my, my, my family's security, uh, mm -hmm. my wife at the time had to go back to work. She had been, you know, a stay at home mom for 12 years. It was a very dark, tumultuous, uh, time in my life. Um, and, and I would say that, uh, at that point, my identity was connected to my success. Mm -hmm. And it felt like God reached into my chest and yanked out my identity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a brutal time. I mean, I, I remember sitting at this beautiful home office and, and I was sitting at my desk and just finally recognizing, this is now about 2010, recognizing that, that this is all over. And, and I was just sort of staring at my blank computer screen. It wasn't even on. And around the corner walked my daughter. Uh, her name's Lizzie. She's 16 now, and she was probably one and a half at the time. She just sort of waddles around the corner. And as soon as I looked at her, I just, I, I just burst into tears mm -hmm. because I felt like I, I failed her, you know, and, and, and her siblings uh, and my ex-wife. It was... Uh, um, it was the thing that I had um, m most wanted to prevent mm -hmm. uh, the fear that they would, that we would all be out in the street, that we'd be homeless, we'd have nothing. Um, and I always overshot that, obviously, um, overachieved. And, and here I was over failing. She wallowed around the corner. I burst into tears. She climbed up into my lap. And, and I still remember watch, watching her little hands with the dimples on the back she's ch chubby little baby and she reached you know to my to my face and, and put her hands on my cheeks mm -hmm. and pushed her nose against my nose so oh. hard I could, I, I could like it was uncomfortable and her forehead against my forehead and she was like, almost like shaking like she was trying to help me get past that and that was made it made it so much harder because <laughs> my one and a half year old daughter was consoling me it was a mm -hmm. uh, stark role reversal um that was that was probably when i hit bottom and none of that would if that all of that stuff didn't exist the, neither would this conversation which is really kind of shocking as i verbalize it to you um because that moment is when i put as soon as she walked out of the office uh and i got my shit together i started working on my resume for the first time since i was 20, 21, 22, when I was in college, a senior in college. Right. Um, past then, it had been, you know, opportunities that were landing in my lap and, and my career tra trajectory was on a giant upswing. And now it was, it was crickets and I had to go sort of reinvent myself all over again. And I was nervous about it going back to my previous industry and it had been several years. And, and I kind of felt like because the manufacturing company I managed was in such a niche um, that I was almost unhirable. Those are all, you know, self limiting beliefs that I had, had kind of bouncing around in my head. But that's how I felt about it. So I was afraid and I didn't want to go back to the previous lifestyle, which was, you know, on an airplane four or five days a week, um, always away from home and the family, um, making intense sacrifices, sacrifices to my health, sacrifices mm -hmm. uh, with my family, um, all to pursue, um, success. So these are the things that were bouncing around my head. And, and I took a break from putting together the rough drafts and went out in the, into the backyard and, and was standing in my jacuzzi and my, I was in the throes of a midlife crisis too. I had long hair and the wind, the, the <laughs> sea breeze I was looking out over the ocean and the, and the wind was blowing through my long, my long hair. And, um, and I remember thinking, yeah, this is, this is all, I wonder what's next. This is all gone sometime mm -hmm. soon. And I had my, my blackberry which was yeah. what people used at that time sitting on the edge of the the uh uh the jacuzzi and it, and it rang um and i picked it up <clears throat> and it was my ex-personal trainer and and he said um 
I'm summarizing now because it's far too long of a story to get accurate on the details, but he said that uh, he was going to shut his business down and heard I was looking for work and um, and wanted to know if I would help him save it. And I jokingly said, I, I will clear my schedule and come up and meet with you. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I it was such a, I appreciate him so much for that moment because I so badly needed for someone just to need me. Yeah. And let me tell you something, this guy really, really needed me. So I told him I would help him out and, uh, and, 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 and find a way to turn the business around up until I got a job and then I'd likely have to relocate because of the industry, probably to Georgia or, or to New York. Um, and, and it would have to leave California and that would be it. So I'd do everything I can to help him in the short term. And then uh, about a month went by um, and I hadn't done anything uh, from a job um, search standpoint because I just didn't, wasn't in my heart. I cleaned up the books. Oh, well, I created the books. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were no books. It was a check manage, management by checkbook, really, was what was going on. There was a just a handwritten checkbook ledger and and that, that was it. So I, I, I created the books uh, and explained them to him and and showed how things would need to change and told him that I think uh, I'd like to stay with him long term and that I would uh, let's put together a, an agreement to to where I, I, I'll earn half of the business. We'd be 50 50 equal partners. I could sense that he was really a little bit nervous about bringing someone like me on as a partner. And I wanted to kind of um, assuage that a little bit. And and so we came to an agreement very, very quickly. Um, I turned the business around. Um, we got it to a point where we were generating cash flow while my family, unfortunately, was starving, really. There was no, I had very little income coming. Neither did he. And um, came to the conclusion that because of the lease, because of the market he was focused on, which was young athletes, um, and because of the compelling impact that the process has had on someone like me, we should focus on people like me. Mm -hmm. And when we need to scrap the brand, scrap the location, get all new equipment, um, because of my expertise in real estate, I, I, I was able to negotiate out of that lease, which is a terrible um, lease to begin with. It was bizarre. And, and so got out of that. We opened a new location. I had $60,000 left, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. I took 42000 of it, paid for some of the build out, borrowed another thirty from a couple of buddies at like 20% interest. And we started Stark on January second of two thousand eleven. Twenty percent interest. Yeah, there was no, there were no loans then. It was two thousand eleven. Right. Banks right. were going under, still right. at that point. At least in the U.S., I'm sure it was similar in, in Canada. Right. Um, but it was a, it was a horrible time to borrow money. Um, but I, w I felt as though we were, we'd be able to service the debt with our cash flow, and we were, uh, we were at a point where. Um, with price changes and uh, and my perception that we would grow a little bit at least um, that we'd be able to handle it and we were able to it was very oh, like when I think about those times it was like a white knuckle uh, experience for two or three four years really like barely squeaking by many many times where I thought this is I'm being an irresponsible father triggering all the stuff that I had dealt with previously. Like, I shouldn't be doing this. I can be way more successful, make way more money, take care of college for kids that are getting older and all sorts of stuff without much effort. And here I am banging my head against the wall. And I had issues with the partnership as well. He was, um, he's a really, really wonderful guy, um, but not a very sophisticated business person. And, and there was constant questioning and and a little bit of backstabbing going on, like venting to clients about me. Uh, and I was in control of the business and he, he didn't like that. He, he wanted to be the one in control and it just the way it worked out. I just, he didn't have the skills to do it. And, and so we went a couple years beyond the white knuckle stage. Um, he told me he wanted to write a book um, and wanted to become a public speaker. And I told him, maybe this is the, the top of our uh, sales funnel. Uh, maybe we can make that work. And so I got him into the Vistage speaking circuit. Are you from the Vistage? Yeah. CEO group? I used to be there. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. I was a Vistage member at the time and and talked to my chair, who was a pretty uh, prolific chair in Southern California. 
And so she pulled some strings and get got Brad into this into the Vistage speaking circuit. He was earning uh, money for our business by speaking. Um, and then the next step was to write a book. Uh, a client introduced us to a ghost writer in Connecticut who has written some amazing books and has a lot of relationships in that community and um, and helped us get um, uh, published through Harper One. Uh, and then Brad wrote the book. Um, and when the book was finally released, I remember sitting, we had a shared office, our backs were to each other. So we're, the, the, you know, the desks were facing the opposite directions. And I was sitting at my computer clicking along and I was sort of like half listening to his conversation with the ghostwriter. And she was um, like, I could hear her through the, through his, um, his little speaker uh, that he had up against his head. And it was like a, an aggressive conversation. And then he got the phone and he, and he turned around and I turned around because it sounded like he needed to talk to me. And, and he said, I, he, she wants me to call all my fam, family and friends and buy a book on Amazon and give us a, a five-star rating and write a, write a review. And I'm like, uh-huh. And he goes, I, I can't do it. I can't ask for that kind of help. The book should stand on its own and da 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 went on and on. We'd, we'd hired, we also hired a PR firm with money we didn't have. Mm -hmm. It's like $10,000 a month for a 12-month period. And, and there were lots of all these articles that, that Brad was featured in and, um, and then the book was launched and, and he, he like stopped and that, 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 that was the final straw for me in our, in terms of our relationship. I had all this drama to manage because of, of the dynamics in the relationship. And then this thing happened after all of these investment dollars went into it. And I, I just, a couple of weeks later, I, I met with him. I was just like, I, I can't, I can't be your partner any longer. So you can, you can buy me out, um, and I'll go off and get a job and make a, a real living, um, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you want. He's like, well, I can't run the business. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know you can. So you know, will you buy me out? And I told him, okay, I'll, I'll buy you out. I'll, I'll, you know what it's worth. We had a valuation done, um, not too, um, uh, maybe a couple of months earlier. I can't even remember why we did that, and. And he's and I'm like you know you know what the business is worth it's not worth a lot um, especially if you exit and you take the speaking revenue with you like there goes all of our profits really uh, but I'll pay you as much as I possibly can and if and I won't personally guarantee it if, if it's too much that the business business can't handle it I'll just close it um, we'll sell off the assets and we'll split it up and that'll be it mm -hmm. and and then within a day of our separation I looked myself in the mirror. I'm like, damn, I've got, now I have nobody to point my finger at. Uh, and I, 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 I recognize that, that, it's only you, that though, right? happened. Yeah. It's only me for everything that, that happened along the way that was messy or didn't work or whatever. I sort of always was like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's that guy. Uh, and I would justify it in my, without even really being aware of it. And, and that moment I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do that anymore. So it's all, it's all on me and, and I've got to make, I've got to make this work. And this, there was a, there was also a competitive thing in there. Like he's gone, he's, you know, there's, there was some drama associated with him exiting and, and some clients leaving because they thought, oh, this is never going to be the same. Um, we don't want to be around for this. We're loyal to him. There was some of that kind of stuff going on. So I had to prove like I had more, uh, more of a chip on my shoulder to prove myself on top of what I showed up with on the first day, which, you know, I don't think I, I have so much any longer, but I definitely had it then. And it was, a, it was part, part of the fuel I needed, I think, to get through those difficult times. And then within a couple of months of really a lot of instability inside the company, employees questioning, like, you know, me telling people that no, no Brad really well, one was even a family member that, Hey, it's going to be okay. Um, some of them thought we were going to fold because of it. And too much later, it was just like that. We, we, yeah. uh, reestablished our structure, allowing us to, uh, integrate with medical practitioners in a state that, uh, has corporate practice and medicine laws in place. It's very complex. Um, but that insulated us from our competitors and we became spectacularly unique in that, in that process. Um, and I, I don't know without my back really pushed up against the wall, mm -hmm. more cash outlay to purchase over time, the half of the business from Brad and, and the emotional, um, thought of failing all over again, 
because you know I explained what happened with Lizzie and crawling up into my lap and all that stuff. And I was I was deathly afraid of being there again. Um, it it worked, um, and we and and we just we continued to grow and um, and when, and and then COVID hit. Uh, my last check to Brad was written on March second of twenty twenty. Wow. Two weeks later, two weeks later, the governor of California shut all businesses down that were non-essential, and so seventy-five uh, percent of the business at Stark was shut down. The doctors continued to operate, and we continued to sell supplements and stuff like that, but it's not a significant part of the business. And so now I had very little cash. We were shut down. It was a very scary time, but we were able to um, prosper through that. Really, not just survive, but but How? we grew. What did you do? How did you pivot? How did I how did I pivot? Yeah. Um, well, uh, f first of all, the, the first step I made, the first thing I did was I met with every single one of our people. At that point, we had maybe 28 employees. Met with them face to face, and I told them, "Tomorrow, I'm shutting our business down. The governor is going to do it like a day later, so I'm, we might as well do it quickly." And and everybody's going to get laid off. Be prepared to file for unemployment because the whole state's going to file for unemployment and you're going to get locked out of the system. It's going to crash. So do it very quickly. Um, and then the next day, I, after sleeping on it, I came back to every single one of them. I said, forget about it. Don't, don't, I'm not going to let you off. We're going to figure out a way to keep everybody on our payroll and you may not have anything to do, or we're going to give you things that were, that are on this, you know, how you've got this entrepreneurial list of things that are like all the ideas in your head mm -hmm. for an existing business that you want to get to and you never get to it. Yeah. You only get to like the top 3%. Well, we had like the 97% of the list over time that I just kept compiling. And we just went after that 97% because we had nothing else to do. And so I just, I, I took my employees and I created committees, um, all working on things that just would be nice to accomplish at some point, like custom hats, and other merchandise and um, uh, various supplement products. Uh, we ended up uh, creating a, a new, um, very high quality organic uh, plant-based uh, protein powder um, that we introduced during during COVID as a result of all of this. New brand, went through the whole trademark process um, during COVID. We just never would have had the time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and and eventually the, the coaches, you know, went to parks and went to people's homes. And so we were, we were sort of working around as, as best we could. Um, but it was a really, um, it was kind of a beautiful time from a, a from the looking at humanity, at least my little bubble of it. Yeah, I, I had, I explained to my people that we have a very limit, we, a very small amount of money, cash available without, a, without the ability to borrow. Um, but I'm, we're going, so we're, everybody's that's on a salary is going to drop substantially. I hope you stay. Uh, all the, all the hour employees, we're going to pay you on average what you've been earning. So you won't see any impact there. Um, and I had some, I had some employees come to me and say, um, you don't have, you don't have to pay me. Uh, if that will make it easier for you to pay these other people, like I'm going to, I'm living with my mom, I'm living with my family. I know that Joe over there is, is on his own and he's really stressed financially. And so everybody uh, attempted to help each other. I couldn't do that legally in the state of California, so I, I didn't. But it was kind of a beautiful thing to see people becoming so selfless through such a scary um, situation. And so eventually we were able to uh, reopen the gyms and everybody came back and most of the team was, was still intact. Um, and for the first time ever, we had people coming to us um, for our holistic approach. Um, previously, um, what I mean by that is previously we had people come to us with fitness outcomes like I want to lose my belly for men mm -hmm. or for women it was maybe I want more tone on my shoulders or I want a bigger booty. That's that. We'll continue our conversation. Um, and in order to do that for people that are, let's say, over 40 and have families and, and have stressful lives, you have to really look at what's going on from an internal health standpoint. So we, that's what we have we have doctors for, we have phlebotomists for. We run a broad range of labs on people to identify areas of opportunity. 
Um, we have a DEXA scan to, I, to take a look at body composition. Um, it's the only real way to measure it other than doing a, an autopsy, which mm -hmm. isn't very practical. Um, <laughs> but when you, when you take labs and you couple it with the DEXA scan, you get this, this perspective on someone's um, entire health picture that you otherwise just don't have. And, 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 and you really don't get it anywhere other than, than Stark. And so we were doing that already so we can give you, we can help you lose the belly fat or, or help your, uh, your girlfriend, your wife or whomever um, with the booty that she wants or whatever other fitness outcome they wanted. But, for the, but during COVID, because people were so afraid of, of getting sick and dying, they came to us for uh, our, our look at their, their health in total. And so for the first time ever, people started coming to us for the reason we actually exist. In the past, it was kind of like kind of like making a smoothie for your kids. You slip a little spinach in there right? Um, because you know they need it. They're not asking for it. They don't want it. And, and, and Stark's labs and DEXA scan and everything else that we did along the way already, it was like slipping spinach in there. We, we know that they needed we needed to, to, to look under the hood to really understand why they don't why they have belly fat there. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on and how we can influence lifestyle and nutrition um, mm -hmm. in addition to exercise to help them get there. Um, so it was a, it was an interesting um, uh, change in consumer sentiment that was beneficial to us. Um, it was also very scary and difficult. You know, we had employees get COVID. Uh, we were, uh, our team of doctors probably treated more active COVID cases than any other doctor in Orange County because Doctors generally don't treat active COVID cases. They tell you to stay home, mm -hmm. take, you know, keep tabs on your temperature, keep tabs on your pulse ox. Uh, if it gets too bad, go to the hospital. Um, they were not seeing patients really, but we were actually treating them effectively. Um, that, to be, that being said though, we still had employees who got sick and they had to quarantine for 14 days early on when the quarantine period was, was 14 days. And so you can imagine as a service business, how disruptive that is. We've got this person sitting at home. They're like binging on Netflix. They feel fine. They felt fine for 10 days, but they have to stay away from us for 14 days. And so there's this constant cycle uh, and we paid them all while they were gone too. So it was a drain on cash flow. It's a very difficult time and a transformational time for Stark all happening at, at once. Um, and so we, we exited it and we're still faced with those with now entrepre the entrepreneurial challenges that I think most business owners are, are facing, which is labor shortage and escalating in, uh, wage inflation, um, mm -hmm. which is really difficult again in a, in a, um, in a business that's, that's uh, primarily a service-based business. Um, so we're, but, but we, but we grew a lot. Uh, and, and, and through that growth, we've arrived at a point where i where the business is large enough and stable enough to, uh, to for me to be able to afford to hire what I would call professional management. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're sort of like uh, going from a teenager to an adult. We've got a little bit of a beard and our, and our voice has <laughs> definitely changed. Um, we still don't think like an adult yet, but we're in an adult body. That's kind of like where, where Stark is. Um, and we're trying to push toward adulthood as fast as we possibly can. And so I just hired uh, three weeks ago, a guy named Mike Abramson, um, who um, has some public company experience and has experience expanding retail, specifically fitness retail businesses across the country. Um, nice. And he's taking over all of my day to day activities um, after the post the transitionary period, which will probably take another couple of months. Um, he's also an attorney. So he's expert level uh, when it comes to things like labor law, which is a big um, challenge for businesses in, in the state of California. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we're in a position where we're, we're now um, transitioning again, um, and we are preparing to, to expand in a much larger way. Um, we have some things, um, some operational processes and, and, and through the use of technology that will streamline our, our um, the, the customer experience quite a bit and provide more data to the to the customer like information on your on your health for example um, some in real time some post lab results things like that um, that will enhance the experience um, but as those are being cleaned up we're really preparing for for a much more aggressive expansion
Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a scary and exciting time. You, you know, you know what this is like. It's a it's an emotional yeah. thing for me. I'm I'm excited, and I'm also wondering, well, well, what? Who am I now? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like like now that I'm not I'm not going to be the person that really runs Stark. What is my next? You know, yeah. what's the next iteration for myself? And and I I don't think if I were only considering myself, I don't think I would have ever made that transition because it's too much, too exciting, and too much fun to run the business. Mm -hmm. But I do think that I am holding the the business back, and I care a lot about the people that work inside the business and the opportunities that greater growth will provide them. Like I've mm -hmm. been able to take us from you know, nothing to ten million. In revenue, but am I the person to go from? Because and I think like that, you know, mm -hmm. survival, um, scrappy. Um, but am I able to transition to that to the person I used to be when I was running the carpet manufacturing company? Yeah. After all these years, I think I can, but I'm. I think it may take far too long for me to do that. And and bringing Mike on, I can just pass the baton and have him do what he does best and I don't have to necessarily uh, transition to a to a different type of manager and leader I can instead focus primarily on the creative aspects of the business which I think are really um, you know back to those teenage years I think those I think that's really um, uh, what I'm suited best for mm -hmm. um, and so so it's a really interesting um, emotional transition one where I feel extreme happiness and extreme sadness and fear and excitement. It's all at the, all at the same time, you know? Yeah, because you're out of your comfort zone. One thing that is clear to me from your whole story is that if God didn't humble you, uh, yeah. you wouldn't be where you are right now because what you're showing right now is an act of humbleness, right? Like, you know you could probably take it to the next level, but you also know that for sure you can get somebody better than you to do it. And that takes... Courage and humbleness, and that's those virtues that you were you acquire by, you know, by going through your trials and tribulations. And you're right; that those are things that are God given. Because when you identify yourself to your success, you fall in the biggest trap in life. Yeah. You know when when there's big recessions and people I know, brother, a ton of money in the stock market and they kill themselves. Why? Yeah. Because they identify themselves with their success, and that's a big lie. It's a big lie. It's a very painful one to climb out of. I can see why people, I remember at the time, at my darkest moments, on a regular basis, falling to my knees alone, praying for God to take my life. Yeah. That's how painful it was. It was, it was a scary, painful ex experience. I'm, I'm, I don't think I have it in me to do that, but, um, but I can certainly see how people can get to that point. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, a feeling of being. It's only my own head and probably theirs as well of being ostracized, being alone. All your friends are going to change. Everybody's going to look at you differently. Yeah, they're not going to see you the same way. They're not going to accept you any longer because the reason they accepted you is because of what you accomplished. Yeah, it's very difficult. And, and yes, it did, that changed me um, per permanently. And I'm grateful for it. I mean, it changed me for the better. For yeah. the better. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is like that, you know, like some people don't have the privilege to go through that and they, they end up alone and miserable. I'm probably rich, but who cares? We come naked to this world and we live naked. Yeah. <laughs> Right? We leave naked, that's for sure. What you take with you is your experiences, your relationships. You know, what you're doing right now is getting out of your comfort zone. Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to reach 100 million with the way things are going. And I know you're going to keep, you're going to be on top of this guy that you just hired. And <clears> if you start franchising, brother, 100 million easy and then publicly traded, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But I know that it's not going to make a big difference in your own life. And that's. No. And that's not the thing, really, right? No. That people don't think. People think that more money is better, and it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. And you, I know you're doing it for the right reason, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we need so little to be happy, M material, we do. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. That doesn't mean we shouldn't keep growing, though. Our future has to be better than our present, but it yeah. has to be 
the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Keep adding value, keep making this world a better place. Mm -hmm. And if you have the God-given ability to grow and expand and provide employment and jobs and push the economy forward, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not for selfish reasons. And that's the big mm -hmm. difference, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a beautiful right. story, brother. This is incredible. I was going to ask you what was the hardest thing in your life, and you already told me. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. amazing. Yeah. Have you ever considered writing a book of, of your life experience? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I have. And that's probably what's next um, at, at post transition with Mike. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe it's two books. One, one is more of a life experience book, and one is about Stark. But they, yeah. they, they're tightly intertwined. We didn't, we're, I know we don't have much time, but we, um, uh, we didn't get much into the purpose behind Stark. And there's a, there's a heavy mission that I, use, that I use to keep myself focused and, and keep our team engaged. Yeah. Um, at, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very powerful leadership tool. Perhaps some other time we can, we can talk more about that. Um, but, for sure, uh, like yeah. I believe that we need a part two for sure. Like we're only halfway through. I, I want to go deep into your business and and uh, you know just the fact that most people go to the gym not not to get healthier but to look better. So it's a vanity thing. Mm -hmm. And you were able yeah. to turn that around into something that will provide you like health to live a beautiful life, not necessarily right. look beautiful. I mean, nothing mm -hmm. wrong with looking beautiful, but what you want is real health, not just vanity, right? That's right. Not just pumping right. asteroids and uh, growing fish. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Brother, thank you so much. Well, I'll get you on a episode number two of this session. We have to make a second one. In the meantime, though, if people would like to learn more about your services, uh, about Stark, where can they find you? Where can they find your company online? They can uh, they can go to our website, which is which is uh, Stark Life. S T A R K. By the way, Stark is German for strong. That's where the name comes from. Starklife.us. 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 Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Thank I'll you, David. You, I'll get you back probably next week or the week after, and uh, we'll continue our conversation. That's all for today's episode of the Break Free Podcast. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Starting your own business can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Visit davidmansilla.com to pick up a copy of the number one international best-selling book, Breaking Out of Corporate Jail. Expand what you consider to be possible and reach your full potential. And join us on the next episode.